as an interesting analogy, what's going on at the level of brain plasticity, we tend to think that, let's say, a dog's brain is pre-wired to drive a dog's body. But one of the examples that I talked about in my book, Live Wired, was this dog who was born without front legs. And yeah. so she just walks bipedally and she moves all around and uh, gets by that way. Why? Because she needed to get to her, you know, her dog bowl and her water and other dogs and so on. And so she just figured it out. It turns out it's not that hard for a dog to walk on back legs. And the question is, could all dogs walk on their back legs? Presumably, but they don't have the proper motivation uh, to do so. But the point is that the, the dog's body is very flexible. It meets the goals of the world. Another analogy is the world's best archer, as in he's got the world record for the longest accurate shot in archery, uh, is a guy named Matt Stutzman, who happens to have no arms. Uh, and he got interested in archery and figured out how to pull the bow with his legs. And so he shoots with his legs and uh, became a great archer that way. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. 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 The plasticity is, is incredible. And, you know, the, the earlier, the earliest example that I know of, of this hind leg thing is, is uh, Slipper's Goat, which was this, I think it was in the 40s. This guy, uh, Slipper, um, published a study of a goat who, again, born without four legs, learned to walk on its hind legs. When they dissected the goat, they found out that a lot of the uh, adjustments that you need for bipedal locomotion, right? So things about the hips, the, you know, the, the spine, all that kind of stuff were all there, right? As opposed to what you normally think of for, for the evolution of modern humans is, you know, how, how many, many hundreds of thousands of years you need for that. And this is what's really interesting about this plasticity is that you can project it into other spaces. So, so as you pointed out, you know, uh, can a, can a dog brain run a, an upright body, right? Now look at, at individual cells, can the same genome run a completely different anatomy and set of behaviors? And this is what we've, this, I mean, other people have shown other, other examples of this, but for example, in our lab, Xenobots, Anthrobots, right? These, these living constructs that have a completely different body than, than what they normally do. They have a different behavioral repertoire, no genetic change, same gene regulatory networks, are running a completely different body. For the listenership, could you define anthrobots and xenobots, which you've built? Sure. Um, let's start with the xenobots. So, so in the case of xenobots, uh, what um, our team did, and this is in collaboration with uh, Josh Bongard's lab at University of Vermont, and this is uh, Doug Blackiston and my group, and uh, Sam Kriegman did a lot of the computational work for it. What happens is that when you liberate some epithelial cells from an early frog embryo, normally what they do is they form this like two-dimensional outer covering of an embryo and the, the you know the, the outer skin layer, and they do that because they're induced to do that by the other cells. Well, if you get them away from the other cells, you sort of liberate them, then you find out what they really want to do on their own. And what they do, they could do many things. They could crawl away from each other. They could die. They could you know, make a flat layer like uh, cell culture. What they actually do is they form this little ball with, with cilia that are on the outside, these little moving hairs, and they organize them so that the thing can swim and it starts swimming around. It has all sorts of interesting behaviors. A couple of years ago, we showed that they do kinematic self-replication, which is that if you sprinkle a bunch of loose skin cells in their environment, they will collect them into little balls and guess what those become? The next generation of xenobots, right? So they can do this weird kinematic replication that uh, as far as we know, no other creature does. They express hundreds of genes differently than, than they do within the embryo. No, no genetic change, by the way, right? This is, this is, we're not adding anything. There are no scaffolds, no, no synthetic circuits, but they use their, their transcriptional affordances differently. They, they try to, hundreds of new genes. And among other things, it turns out they're sensitive to acoustic vibrations. That's the latest thing that just came out a month ago is that we can, because we found they were turning on a bunch of genes related to hearing. And we said, is it possible that these things could hear? And so, uh, Vaikov Pai, my group, um, put a speaker under them and showed that, yeah, there's actually sounds you can send them that they will, that they will respond to. So that's, Xenobots. Anthrobots are a similar story because when we first did it, some people said, well, you know, they're embryonic cells and the amphibia are plastic. Maybe that's why this is like a frog embryology thing. You know, this is specific to Xenobots. So I said, okay, what's the furthest you can get from an embryonic frog? Well, that would be an adult human. And so we went and we took, um, uh, tracheal epithelial cells from, from adult human patients. And we showed, and this is, uh, Gizem Gumushka's work, a PhD student in my group who we developed a protocol whereby, again, simply by taking the cells out of their normal context, you get to release their uh, the, the various possible outcomes that they can do, and they make anthrobots. It's a little um, a round little thing that, that that zips around. It has a couple of interesting properties. First of all, it it can heal neural wounds. So if you played a dish of human neurons and you put a big scratch through it with a scalpel, they will, when they find the scratch, they settle down, a bunch of them, we call it a superbot cluster, they, they, they settle down, 
And within about four days, if you lift them up, you see that what they did for what they did meanwhile is they healed across the they healed across the gap. Okay, who who would have thought that your tracheal epithelial cells that sit there quietly dealing with you know mucus and and, and the air particles um, have the ability to 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 heal neurons? And these guys express about nine thousand genes differently than right. So about almost half the genome they express differently than uh, than they do in the body. Um, they're by the way younger than the patient than the than the cells that they came from so so actually that process of becoming an, an anthrobot actually rolls back the epigenetic clock so um so they're 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 a bit younger this is fascinating you know behaviors and and all of this is run by that standard controller so so that's kind of my point is that is that there's an amazing plasticity in the brain and nervous system but this goes all the way down this is not just for you know fancy fancy brains so we think about this as problem solving by the system and what's interesting let's just come back for a second to the the dog or the goat without four limbs, we generally assume, okay, look, if you're born with the typical structure of the animal, then you just develop in this way. But otherwise, there's a lot of deep problem solving that has to go on. But I know that you think about it as, hey, maybe the system is always problem solving. Maybe it's problem solving no matter what, if you have front legs or not. It's just figuring out what to do to get to the goals. Yeah, I think I think that's right. And and you know, in the last couple of years, we've really um, uh, emphasized this and, and started to develop this idea that you know you can think about it as as beginner's mind. Basically, the way the, the reason that all these incredible plast uh, the plasticities exist. You know, when when we make a, a Doug Blackiston um, years ago in our lab made a, made tadpoles with eyes on their tails, and these these guys could see. They were not connected to the brain. They make an optic nerve that connects sometimes to the spinal cord, sometimes to the gut, sometimes nowhere. They can, they can see and they can learn visual tasks. Why does that work out of the box? Why don't you need, you know, new rounds of selection, mutation, you know, basically adaptation? All of these things, plasticities work, I think, because it never expected everything to be in the right place to begin with. It has to solve the problem from scratch every single time. And that goes back to the idea that biology is fundamentally dealing with an unreliable medium. Think about the way we build computers today. So we have um, error correcting codes. We have abstraction layers, right? The, the reason that we, you know, our microchips can't can't scale down easily is because you don't want the the, the data interfering with each other, right? When you get to that atomic limit, you know, the 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 memory, um, uh, the bits that are in there are start starting to you know interact with each other, and you don't want that. All, all of all of our current computer technology is built around the fidelity of the data. And that's because the interpreter of that data is us, the user. We don't, you know, the computer has no issues. It doesn't need to interpret the data. We interpret the data. So all the computer has to do is, is keep the data still. Biology is exactly the opposite. First of all, you have no hope of keeping anything still in biology. You have no idea, never mind your environment, but you're going to mutate as a lineage. You're going to mutate. You can't count on your parts. You can't count on, on, you know, knowing how many copies of any protein you're going to have. Things degrade. The environment, you know, internal milieu, eh, it's plus or minus, you know, whatever, homeostasis. But things are always changing. So I think what biology really cranks on, and we've done computational simulations showing how this happens, that the minute you have this kind of uh, problem-solving material, I call it an agential material because it's not just the computational material, it's actually an agential material. And the minute you have that material, evolution, it, it starts to hide information from selection because you're not looking at the genome, you're looking at the, 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 what's going on after you've, you've solved the problem using whatever tools the genome has given you. And that means that evolution starts to spend a lot of its time cranking on that problem-solving capacity. It spends, uh, you know, less of its time um, uh, on the on the hardwired mechanisms and more of its time on that creative confabulatory problem-solving. So I see all of these things, you know, behavioral memories, genetic memories, meaning you know your genome of your lineage. All of these things are basically messages. They're messages from your past self. They're prompts. But at any given moment, it's up to you how you're going to interpret them. And, and the biological material has eons of, of, of pressure to learn to tell good stories with whatever it's given, whatever information it's given. And that's morphogenesis and behavior and so on. 